Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining Winslow Technology Group and Arctic Wolf Networks to discuss New York State's new data security law, the Stop, Hacks, and Improve Electronic Data Security Act, also known as the New York Shield Act. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alex Zagievsky. I'm one of the senior security, uh, senior solutions architects for Winslow Technology Group. And joining me this morning is Jeff Miller from Arctic Wolf Networks. We'll kick it off today with a brief overview of Winslow. Then I'll hand the mic over to Jeff to tell you more about Arctic Wolf and discuss the new data security regulations in greater detail. Finally, we'll wrap up by answering any questions you may have. And you should feel free to ask those questions at any time via the chat feature of this webinar. So a little bit about Winslow. Uh, we have been in business for over 16 years as a technology solutions provider headquartered in Waltham, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. We have a distributed workforce and recently opened satellite offices in Charlotte, North Carolina, as well as New York City. We aim to identify and develop expertise in game-changing technologies, like our partner, Arctic Wolf. Winslow works with customers, like you, to tailor technology solutions that solve for both today's problems and tomorrow's opportunities. We specialize in both hardware and software, as well as services for the core data center and user compute and cybersecurity. Winslow is a Dell Technologies Titanium partner, and we're proud to have industry-recognized awards, including both Dell Technologies Partner of the Year and Arctic Wolf Partner of the Year for 2019. We have an installation base in 37 states, as well as four Canadian provinces and other international locations as well. Regarding cybersecurity, Winslow's services follow the NIST cybersecurity framework. And illustrated here, a bit of an eye chart, I'm afraid, is how the various technologies and services we offer line up with the five pillars of that framework. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff Miller, who will introduce Arctic Wolf and lead our session on the New York Shield Act. Jeff, over to you. Thanks, Alex. Well, I appreciate everybody joining today. I know it's 30 minutes of your time, but it's 30 minutes well spent. Uh, we'll get into the SHIELD Act shortly, but Arctic Wolf is uh, here to protect you guys, here to help you out with the SHIELD Act. We have uh, we know about it. We understand it. Um, I'm physically in Albany, New York, so when it comes to New York uh, legislation and access to the people who write the laws, I'm just down the road. So I've got, I've got a pretty good understanding of what's going on and how to help you guys get compliant. Um, Arctic Wolf is a company that helps other companies determine if they've been hacked and stop the bleeding before it becomes a company ending event. That's why we exist. And just like Winslow, we do align with the NIST cybersecurity framework in the five pillars you see in the middle. So again, we're here to help you not only be compliant with SHIELD, understand SHIELD, but also even outside of that, help you manage risk and detect and respond to incidents in your environment. So a little bit about the agenda today. Uh, we'll go over what is the SHIELD Act. Alex went through the acronym, Stop Hacks and Improve Electronic Data Security. It's quite the mouthful, so we just say SHIELD. Uh, we'll talk about what information is protected under the SHIELD Act. You, you really should pay attention because it is a broad redefinition of what's considered private information under the new act. We'll talk about how you can comply what the penalties are for non-compliance. And we're not here to do fear, uncertainty, and doubt, but just understand that there is uh, there are penalties for non-compliance right out of the gate, unlike some other regs like HIPAA that took a dozen years to, to get teeth. And like Alex said, we'll go over Q&A, open it up for people who have questions in the chat box to ask any burning questions you have on, on your mind. And if we aren't able to get to it today, we can certainly talk offline. We'll provide our contact information. All right, let's move to the next slide. So again, this, the New York State Shield Act is why you're uh, you're here today. Again, this, it's it's uh, an acronym for Stop Hacks and Improve Electronic Data Security. Let's move to the next slide. So why do we need an act like this? Well, first of all, it's not a new regulation. It's an amendment to existing New York State general business law. 
so if you look that up, 899-AA, that is New York State's breach notification law. It, it affects any business, for-profit, non-for-profit, uh, that stores information of New York State residents. It is not optional. You can't say I'm too small. You can't say um, I don't have enough revenues. There's no exemption whatsoever with the Shield Act. So, if you you know historically have not had to comply with things like PCI or HIPAA or any other regulations, the Shield Act is is mandatory. It's, again, it's not optional, and it, in itself, it's not a brand new law. Rather, it's an extension again of existing New York State. Uh, breach notification requirements. It's pretty hot off the press. Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York State signed the SHIELD Act on July 25th, so just a few months ago. It goes effective March 21st, so we're looking at today, February 12th, so that's just a few weeks out. The Act becomes effective and failure to comply with it means, of course, penalties, like we said. The Act itself is, again, it's a breach notification law, uh, but within that law, there's a significant component that talks about strict data security requirements. In other words, what controls must your business or your organization have in place to protect private information of New York State residents? And the law outlines what those things are, so that will be part of what we talk about today. All right, let's move to the next slide. All right, so this is a, again, pay attention here. We're completely redefining what's considered private information under the SHIELD Act. So it, it's important to understand, you know, you, you may have had a concept of what was considered private before with a lot of the way that technology is moving forward and advancing. Um, it, it's really redefining uh, what private information is. So let's move to the next slide and we'll talk about what's considered private under the SHIELD Act. So intuitively, I think we all understood, you know, last year or five years ago that, you know, Jeff Miller plus 123 Main Street, if that was my home address, or Jeff Miller plus has asthma, like a, like a medical condition, or, you know, any, any kind of personal identifiers like that was considered private information. It was almost just understood on a street level by anybody and everybody. Under the SHIELD Act, there are, there's new uh, categories of what's considered private information. For example, on the bottom bullet point here, if I have your username and let's say uh, your mother's maiden name, which is a, an answer to a security question to get into like a financial account online, that's considered private information. Even if that username isn't directly, you know, there's no, no correlation to an individual person per se that ties it back to you. That is, that is now considered private information, which it wasn't before. Um, in the middle here, you see credit or, credit or debit card information without any additional identifying information. Again, that's new. That was not considered private information before, just the mere credit card information on its own. Okay, so those two categories have now expanded what New York State considers to be private information worthy of protecting. And of course, worthy of notifying consumers if there is a breach. Uh, so, so it's important to say, okay, well, this is what my policies and procedures were in the past. Now with this additional information, do I need to make any changes? And, and really ask yourself that question. Now that the definition is broadened, do we need to take another look at my data protection practices? The answer is probably yes. All right, let's proceed. All right. What, how do, you know, how do we comply, right? That's why we're all here today. Let's move to the next slide. We'll talk about what is meant by breach notification. So in addition to the, the New York State Shield Act redefining what is considered private information, it also tightens uh, what is considered a breach. And it used to be the fact that if somebody went into your network, stole a database of consumer information, or maybe you had a, a user who wasn't paying attention and left their laptop, out in public and, and somebody got access to that laptop and, and stole it, access to the information that's, that was private was considered a breach. We all know that, we all understand that. Under the New York State Shield Act, mere unauthorized viewing of private information is now considered a breach. 
even if that data never leaves the company's network. So understand that that now broadens the definition of, of what is a breach and therefore when you have to notify uh, different parties. So speaking of when, this, this SHIELD Act now gives companies three days or 72 hours to notify affected individuals that their information was part of a breach. Even if that data wasn't stolen, even if it never went on the dark web, if it was just viewed by somebody who did not have, have the privilege or the, the explicit um, access to it with permission, that's considered a breach and you have 72 hours to notify consumers. You can't do what they used to do two, three, four years ago and say, hey, guys, we had a hack back in May and, you know, it's September now and now we're going to let everybody know once we had a chance to get our ducks in a row and, and come up with a pretty PR plan. No longer is that acceptable. 72 hours is pretty aggressive, you might think, and I would agree with you. But if you have a strong incident response plan in place, it's, it's not unmanageable. You have to notify consumers if it's their information that gets stolen. You also have to notify the New York State Attorney General's Office. The, the New York State Attorney General's Office is the entity that is enforcing the New York State SHIELD Act. In addition, if there's medical information or other types of information, you might have to notify the Health and Human Services Secretary and other entities as well, depending on the nature of the data. Now, in terms of how do I comply with the act, there is a statement within the New York State SHIELD Act that says, if you can already demonstrate compliance with the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, HIPAA, or the New York State DFS regulation known as 23NYCRR500, any one of those, if you are able to fully demonstrate with proof that you're in compliance with one or more of these regs, then you are deemed compliant with the New York State SHIELD Act. Great. Uh, but you have to be able to demonstrate it. There's no, you know, saying it and not doing it, right? At some point, if you get breached, you will end up in front of a judge. So it's, it's best to be honest. Uh, even though you can comply with these other laws, the, the most restricting factor is going to be the SHIELD Act, again, with the 72-hour notification requirement. So, yes, you can comply with the other things, but you still have to notify affected consumers and the Attorney General of New York State within three days, even if you are in compliance with these other regs. All right, let's move to the next slide. So again, it's a breach notification requirement, but a large component of the SHIELD Act is the requirement to implement a data security program with quote unquote reasonable safeguards. So Alex and I will take you through a guided tour on what is meant by reasonable safeguards. What is reasonable from an administrative, in other words, workforce perspective to protect private information? What are technical safeguards that need to be put in place as required by SHIELD? And then of course, physical, dealing with the real world, anything that we can touch. So those are the three categories that, that SHIELD Act breaks things down into. And we'll move to the next slide and Alex and I will take you through what is explicitly called out in the SHIELD Act. So you see the bullet points here, we don't, uh, we're not making this up, these are all explicitly called out in the SHIELD Act as requirements for any organization storing even one record of private information of a New York State resident. Okay, and that's probably all of you on the phone today. So Alex, I'll let you kick off just a couple of these first bullet points um, and then I will, I'll tie it up. Sure, thanks Jeff. So um, yeah, as, as you see that um, we have uh, dedicated cybersecurity staff um, and also identify internal and external risks as the first uh, two bullets, uh, and then also assess sufficiency of safeguards. Uh, those can be done predominantly through a combination of services that are offered by Arctic Wolf as well as uh, Winslow. Uh, Arctic Wolf, uh, like uh, many experts in their arena, tend not to dilute their um, their pool of expertise by getting themselves into a lot of areas and rather focus on their specialities, which would be the manage risk and manage uh, detection and uh, resolution. So um, Winslow then uh, supplements that by, uh, and we'll touch on this uh, later on in the um, in the presentation. Uh, we can supplement those offerings with the uh, the Secure Score assessment. 
Uh, additionally, however, we also partner with Winslow Technology Group with providers such as Know Before to uh, provide services such as employee training on security. Um, and then finally, uh, we do have the uh, third party vendor management uh, functionality as well. Jeff? Yeah, and, and I'll make a point there, Alex, on the third party vendor management. When DFS, the, the Department of Financial Services, really ham started hammering banking, insurance, and financial services back in spring of 2017, third party vendor management was a huge section of that regulation, like, like an entire honking paragraph. And what I'm seeing now with all these newer regulations like Shield Act, like the California Online Privacy Act, I'm seeing third party vendor management become an increasingly large focus of these regulations. And what does that mean? It means if I'm in a position to help secure my company, if I'm the CISO, the CTO, the director of IT, no longer can I just say I'm secure, but I also have to be able to say, and I'm working with people who treat data with regard. Um, so if that's your janitorial staff that's in your building, if that's you know cloud providers, if you're moving workflows to Office 365 or other areas, you've got to look at who you're plugged into and ensure that they're secure, not just that you're secure. One of the ways that folks do that is, is SOC 2 compliance. So Arctic Wolf, for example, is SOC 2 compliant. What that means is every single year we, we pay a CPA firm to come in, provide an independent audit of our security controls, so that people know when they're working with us they're, that we're vetted with a third party that's not biased in any way, shape, or form. I could go on and on about third party vendor management. I won't with, with the time here, but know that that's an important part and a consideration of any new regulation, including the SHIELD Act. All right, let's move to the technical safeguards now. So again, administrative deals with the workforce. Technical deals with the bits, the bytes, the traffic flow, the data itself. Alex, I'll let you take the first uh, the first two bullet points, and then I'll come in on the third. Sounds good. So the risk assessment is again um, hailing back to the, uh, the the secure score, which is uh, something that we'll touch upon uh, in just slightly uh, greater detail in one of the later slides. And essentially, what that's going to accomplish is um, go through your entire uh, environment and uh, line up how you have um, perhaps uh, exposed yourself by, by virtue of just conducting your business in a normal everyday manner to uh, various risks uh, in terms of cybersecurity. Once having identified that, uh, we can start putting in places um, where needed various different um, safeguards uh, that will effectively prevent potential intrusion and so on. Um, as mentioned uh, earlier, um, Winslow partners with a number of organizations that uh, can very, very nicely address the five pillars of the, uh, the NIST framework. And then on the detection response side, so it doesn't say in the SHIELD Act you need to have detection and response. What it does say is companies that store private information of New York State residents must monitor for unauthorized access to that private information. We translate that to meaning you need some kind of detection and response mechanism in place. So what that generally means is having some kind of 24 by 7 by 365 service that's looking for indicators of compromise, active threat hunting, correlating different logs, events, and alerts within the environment to piece them all together and be able to answer the question, have I been breached? Fundamentally, have I been breached is the question you need to know when it comes to reporting in the first place. So if you can't, if you don't have a mechanism to know that you've been breached, then you're likely not going to be able to comply very well with the SHIELD Act because that's the whole point of it is knowing you've been breached and then reporting and showing due diligence when you have. All right, so again, I think people think of uh, cyber laws or, or breach notification laws as primarily cyber related um, you, because, right, cyber security, stop hacks. You think of the, the world of hacking as strictly a digital thing, uh, but it's not. Um, you'll see with the physical safeguards we have here, it's important uh, to dispose of data properly. It's important to um, not leave things out that, that people have access to. It's important to have door access controls. It's 
It's important not to let people in the building if they're not badged. So there's a, a strong focus, not just on the cyber and work uh, workplace components of the SHIELD Act, but also physical protection as well. And I, I know, Alex, you have a couple of things you wanted to say here. I think you've captured uh, all of this rather succinctly, but uh, it's, it's probably a good uh, moment to bring up the fact that you know, data is uh, breached and uh, unauthorized access, and not just uh, digitally. Physical access is probably one of the uh, oldest uh, methods of uh, stealing data. Yeah, I see that too. So I monitor um, what's called the wall of shame. So the Department of Health and Human Services presides over healthcare organizations, and hhs.gov is where healthcare organizations that undergo breaches of 500 or more patient records must, by law, basically be listed on that, that wall of shame to show that how they got breached, what the number of records was, and so on. And I, and I would agree with Alex that well over half of those incidents that I see were things like somebody stole a laptop, the laptop wasn't encrypted, um, it was a dumpster diving incident where records were stolen, it was somebody got into the building, so a lot of times that's the way that information is getting stolen. Um, and of course, the other percentage of time, it's, it's really phishing emails and, and the standard stuff that you see in the news. So physical is just as, as important, like Alex said, as cyber. Let's move on to the next slide here. So we said it earlier, um, HIPAA took about a dozen years to get teeth to really get momentum and, and for people to essentially get slapped on the wrist for not doing their due diligence. Right out of the gate, the, the Shield Act is is has teeth essentially. So on the next slide, we'll show you what that means. So um, I think of states like Ohio. Um, about a year and a half ago, Ohio passed um, a, a protection act that basically gives organizations a safe harbor if they've got information of Ohio residents and they do all their due diligence and they have all these protections in place. It gives them a safe harbor against legal tort or action against them. Unfortunately, for folks that, that are storing private information of New York State residents, under the SHIELD Act, there is no protection. There is no safe harbor. Even if you're doing all of those administrative, physical, and technical things we just talked about. Um, so that's kind of contrary to what some other states are doing. And so it's just interesting to see. In addition to actual costs and losses, uh, fines can be levied, again, by the New York State Attorney General's Office for up to a, a quarter million dollars. And it says $20 per instance of failed notification. Just an example, if you have one Excel spreadsheet, one database, one file that just manages to make its way out of your network or somebody views it, easily, if you add up the rows in, in that single file, it could be thousands of rows of private information. So one file could, could equal a quarter million dollars in fines. And of course, to lob on top of that, any or, any other lawful remedy available, which you know that the lawyers will go after. Um, we don't bring this up to scare you. We bring this up because this is built into the law, and it's super important that your your company doesn't end up in a, in a quarter million dollar loss plus legal fees and other losses. Um, how do you not get fined? Well, you you have to again notify people within that 72 hour time frame as required by the New York State Shield Act. You have to know what the private information is. The broad, again, it broadens the definition of what's considered private. Um, having a plan in place is incredibly important and, and not just doing things last minute because there's certainly no way you can do it in 72 hours without a, without a proper plan. All right, next slide. I guess I'll grab this one, Jeff. Um, uh, to echo an old uh, saying that I've always uh, been, you know, impressed with is, uh, you know, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. So uh, to echo off of uh, Jeff's words from just a second ago, if uh, you have not made up um, any sort of um, preparations, uh, rehearsed the plan, the tabletop exercises, and then in fact are met by a breach, probably uh, not not a wonderful idea. So to that end. Um, the overall overarching question really is, you know, uh, are you safe? And that's actually uh, one of the questions that our school aims to answer, as do we, by offering our secure score, which uh, is something that we're happy to go over with 
each and every one of our clients. It will take only about 60 minutes of your time. We'll sit down in a consultative you know, type of thoughtful uh, delivery, which is essentially the way that we try to deliver all of our solutions to all of our clients. Um, as part of my uh, 24 years in the uh, support roles, um, I have had the uh, pleasure of working in both healthcare and uh, financial sectors. So HIPAA regulations, as well as uh, Sarbox um, and so on, are very near and dear to my heart. So folks like me would be delighted to spend the time and uh, at no cost uh, provide you with a deliverable that will give you an idea of where you currently stand. So please do contact your Winslow County Executive uh, for an assessment. And on that note, um, I am not uh, seeing any questions. So I believe we're going to wrap up. Jeff, any final thoughts? Yeah, so we'd like to do these educational webinars. We're doing them monthly. And the next one what we're going to do, as you see here, is March 11th, same time, 1130 Eastern. And if you had to ask yourself or ask any security professional, if you could only do five things to protect yourself, only five things and not six, not seven, not 10, what would those five things be? We've, got, we've compiled a list of what those five fundamental core things would be when you strip away everything else. And we'll talk about that again on March 11th. Uh, we'll have the, the landing page for that up on winslowtg.com slash events. Like Alex said, uh, we love doing this. We love the educational piece of it. We don't wanna be salesy. We just want everybody to step up and learn more and, and be aware of what's out there to protect themselves. All right. Thank you, Jeff. On that note, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. We hope this was valuable. And if you'd like more information on either Winslow or Arctic Wolf, please contact us at webinars at winslowtg.com. On behalf of both Winslow and AWN, thank you and have a great day.